This is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davey Crockett. Thanks. Thanks for coming. This is episode 83. In this episode, I will tell the story of the forgotten great ultra runner, Hardy Ballington of South Africa. 2021 marks the 100th anniversary of the Comrades Marathon, about 54 miles, held in South Africa. Some of the greatest ultra runners of the early 1900s came out of South Africa and made a racing career running at Comrades. Hardy Ballington of South Africa is the forgotten man of ultra running. This episode about him is based on the research of ultra running historian Andy Milroy of England. During his celebrated running career, Hardy Ballington was hailed the second Arthur Newton and a human machine. Dominant immediately before and after the Second World War, he was awarded the prestigious Helms Trophy for his remarkable performances in England in 1937. Ballington also made an impact on ultra running decades later because of his training approach that was highlighted in the classic book Lore of Running. It focused on a gradual progression in training rather than the intensity of that training. The goal was to condition the body to run the long distances required for an ultra marathon. Hardy Robert Ballington was born on July 14, 1912, in Durban, one of the major ports in South Africa. His father was Edward William Ballington and his mother Kate Elizabeth Sims, both born in England. He was one of seven brothers and three sisters, the third eldest child, one of twins. His father, Edward, came from a military family born in North England in 1870. He enlisted in the army at the age of 14 and served at least a decade. By 1892, at the age of 21, Edward was working for the railroad as a switcher. Life was rough. That year, he was convicted for stealing two knives and two pair of carver's knives and sentenced to one month in prison in Wakefield. After immigrating to South Africa, Edward met and married an English immigrant, Kate Sims, and in 1910, they had their first son, Edward, named after his father. Twins Hardy and Ernest Stanley were born in 1912. Other siblings came, but four died in their childhood. In 1915, the whole family to that date, four boys, traveled by ship to England, presumably to see grandparents and other relations. This was the first of Hardy's many trips to England and set the stage for a lifetime of world travel. In 1921, tragedy struck the young family. Hardy's father, Edward, died prematurely in his early 50s, leaving his wife to take care of the six surviving children alone. But worst was to follow. Three years later, the 40-year-old Kate Elizabeth gave birth to her 11th child, but complications and a heart attack caused her death. The baby died. The six Ballington minor children were orphaned. Hardy was only 11. The children were initially put in the care of the Society for the Protection of Child Life in Cape Town. It is unlikely that they were kept together if adoption was an option. Later in life, Hardy listed Robert and Jane Ballington as his parents, so he may have been raised by distant relatives. At only 11, Hardy joined the Scouts, which offered him structure and stability after the chaos of his parental bereavement. Five years later, he traveled to England as a scout patrol leader as part of a large South African contingent to the World Scout Jamboree at Errol Park with scout founder Robert Baden-Powell. By age 18, in 1930, Ballington had become fat and unhealthy. After a period in the hospital, he decided to take up running to get fit. After night classes he had been taking, he trained on roads before sunrise so no one would see him. He had no intention of becoming a competitive runner. Distance running gave him a sense of control, of order, and structure. In 
1931, at the age of 19, Ballington entered a marathon in Peter Maritzburg, where he was not known, and to his surprise and delight, he finished fourth. He was seen out training by a comrade's veteran, Vernon Jones. Jones noticed the huge size of Hardy Ballington's calves and said to him, Young man, you ought to take part in the Comrades Marathon. The first Comrades Marathon, about 54 miles, was held in 1921, and the story is told in episode 80. Each year, the race either started or finished in Ballington City of Durban. For any distance runner in Durban, tackling the Comrades Marathon became an ambition. But an appendix operation delayed his debut in the race until 1932. The event was not huge, just 65 starters. By that year, the road was paved the entire way. The novice Ballington ran with three savage brothers and did very well, finishing in fourth in eight hours and one minute. The next year, the 1933 Comrades, was the coldest and wettest to date, with sleet that turned into a torrential rain. The strong, compact, 20-year-old Ballington was well suited to such conditions, but he even donned a dark sweater as protection. He finished in 6 hours 50 minutes, breaking the Comrades Down record that had been held by legendary Arthur Newton. By then, Hardy Ballington was corresponding with Newton, who was in England and received encouragement and coaching tips. Ballington's mileage increased. In 1932, he ran 2,132 miles. The Up Comrades race from Durban in 1934 was also wet. Ballington and Bill Cochran, good friends and close rivals, ran together. The pace was faster than before. Ballington hit a bad patch and fell behind Cochran. At Enchanja, he heard a spectator comment that his win in 1933 must have been a fluke. This spurred him on, and he gradually recovered from the bad patch. Cochran was in the lead, and Ballington set off in a relentless pursuit. He caught up and passed Cochran, and went on to win again in 7 hours and 9 minutes. Ballington became the first man since Newton to win the Comrades twice. In an article he wrote in 1968, Ballington recounted a story which showed both his lack of ego and his strong friendship with Bill Cochran and Vernon Jones. It took place after the 1934 Comrades and involved Ballington's youthful looks. The following Sunday, I took a drive with my friends Vernon Jones and Bill Cochran to a tea garden for a morning tea and to relax. Nearby, two girls aged about seven and nine years were playing on a swing. After a while, one of the little girls came up to me and said, Sonny, won't you come and swing with us? <laughs> Vernon Jones never let me forget that incident. At the 1935 Comrades, Ballington would race his great friend and rival Cochran. Cochran had been keeping track of Ballington's training and strived to surpass it. Cochran won, and Ballington finished second, less than two minutes behind. Bill Cochran then announced his retirement, having succeeded in his great ambition to win the Comrades. He was just 24 years old. Early in 1936, Ballington ran in the Olympic Marathon Trials in the South African Marathon Championships against some of the fastest marathon runners in the world. He finished fourth behind Johannes Coleman, Jackie Gibson, and Wally Hayward. The 1936 Comrades looked easier for Ballington. Cochrane had retired. By the halfway point, he was in second place, about 18 minutes faster than his best up-course split time. There was a cold, biting wind, but the sturdy, compact Ballington appeared untroubled. He was crewed by his twin brother, Stanley, who gave him orange aid with added sugar and beef tea, which helped him in cold conditions. This time, his opposition was the clock, as he drove himself intent to break the up-course record. He succeeded, breaking the record by 11 minutes, running 6 hours, 46 minutes, over an hour ahead of second place. Ballington recalled, Since 1933, I had shown steady improvement in my running, and now in 1937, the Durban Athletic Club members considered I had attained world class 
and decided to send me to England to run the London to Brighton race and also the 100 miles from Bath to London. What a difference there is in traveling today as compared to how I did in 1937. I had to go by sea and spend over three weeks on board from Durban to England. My big trouble was to keep fit. After leaving Cape Town, I had to get up every morning at 2 a.m. and train along the deck of the ship. Twelve times around the deck equaled one mile, and I averaged 300 laps each morning. On arrival in England, I was met by the great Arthur Newton. It was our first meeting, although we had corresponded for several years. Arthur Newton introduced me to Joe Binks, the sports editor of the News of the World. Joe Binks wrote in his paper that South Africa had sent a schoolboy over to do a man's job and was not impressed. However, this made me all the more determined, and I moved into the country to concentrate on my training. The News of the World report described the scene at the beginning of the London to Brighton race, 52 miles. It was a fine bright morning when the eight runners lined up under Big Ben. The enthusiastic early spectators gave them a hearty cheer as they went off. Ballington and Chapman, a 2.57 marathon runner, led the way. After 10 miles, a strong southwest wind and heavy rain began. Ballington continued with a decidedly powerful action. He was in the lead and running like a machine, reaching the halfway in 2 hours 36 minutes within 4 minutes of the record. He said he would not mind the rain increasing, if only the wind would ease. Conditions worsened. Ballington felt the record was beyond him, but was reassured by Newton, who was crewing for him. Ballington later wrote, In the early stages, I experienced quite a lot of muscle troubles caused by the cold weather, and I must say, if it had not been for Arthur Newton, I doubt I would have made the grade. By 40 miles, he was seven minutes ahead of the record time. He slowed to consolidate his resources and asked for hot tea. He continued to slow over the last six miles and finished in five hours, 53 minutes, 42 seconds. The newspaper described Ballantin at the finish. His eyes were feeling rather sore from the buffeting of the wind. First, it was announced that Ballington had broken Newton's record by 90 seconds. Then he had failed by 12 seconds. But eventually it was pointed out that Newton had finished 130 yards further back on a shorter course. It was decided, with the influence of Newton, to give Ballington the record by one second. Huh? It was a record held for the next 16 years. A hundred miles, a hundred miles, a hundred miles, a hundred miles. You can hear the whistle blow a hundred miles. Next up was to attempt to go after the road 100 mile world record that had traditionally been set on the flat road from Bath to London. Newton held the record with 14 hours, 22 minutes. The track record was held by Charles Rowell with 13 hours, 26 minutes set way back in 1882 in Madison Square Garden. See episode 56. After winning London to Brighton, Ballington wrote, I moved to the West Country to train for the 100 miles during the time of June, the weather was perfect, and I covered about 1,400 miles in training. I stayed in Newbury for a while and then decided I would move nearer to Bath, so arranged to stay with people near Marlborough. You can imagine my surprise when I turned up at the residence to be told that there was no bath in the house, and if I wanted a bath, I could use a tub in the living room once a week. You bet I decided to stay in Newbury. The 100 mile was run on a very hot day, the 3rd of July, 1937. It was a very interesting road, right across England, and ending up at the heart of London. The heat was so intense in London that day that the Wimbledon tennis finals had to be delayed for two hours. Handling Ballington were Arthur Newton and Mike McNamara who had run 14 hours, 9 minutes for 100 miles in Canada on an indoor track. After a good breakfast of scrambled eggs and toast, Ballington set off at 3.30 a.m. 
The starting point was at the Bear Inn in the small village of Box. His aim was to hold an eight miles an hour pace. Vernon Jones believed Ballington was clearly overtrained when he started the run with a severe headache. He complained that he felt tired out. He was also crewed by a young man from Durban named Fletcher. Fletcher would jump out one of the accompanying cars, discover what drinks Ballington needed, then return to the car. The car would then drive 100 yards ahead so the drink could be prepared. 40 miles came in 4 hours 52 minutes. Shortly before 50 miles, Ballington was given his first water jug shower to mitigate against the increasing heat. His crew had to buy fresh supplies on the way. His crew had challenges. Noon had to deal with an unfortunate episode in a tea shop where the hotty proprietor would only serve tea in cups for drinking on the premises and would not allow Newton to fill a flask to take outside to the thirsty Ballington. Because it was so hot, water jug showers were given after each drink and in between as well. Ballington got blisters as the skin on its feet were softened by the water. But the combination of the cold water showers and a light breeze kept Ballington comfortable. After 60 miles, hot tea and lemonade were constantly needed after a couple miles. This was followed by his first solid food. Jam sandwiches supplanted by lemonade. He went through 65 miles in 8 hours 17 minutes. At 70 miles, Ballington had a bad patch, although he was still running 7.5 miles an hour. McNamara ran with him for 10 miles in long trousers and boots, having a one-sided chat to take Ballington's mind off of his blistering feet and tired legs. This gave Ballington a boost. A cyclist joined them and was able to guide the tiring Ballington into and through London to Hyde Park Corner, where he finished in a new 100-mile world record of 13 hours, 21 minutes, 19 seconds. Ballington wrote afterwards, I received a tremendous reception on arrival in Hyde Park and broke the world record by over an hour. For the following week, both Ballington and Newton held daily public appearances at the News of the World Sports Department. Ballington returned home to a city reception in Durban to celebrate his feats in England. He was given a job by the Durban City Council to work in the Treasury Department. In 1938, Ballington returned to the Comrades. He was not the only Ballington in the race. His younger brother John was also running. Only 20 runners entered the race that year. Alan Boyce, who had finished second in the 1937 race, took the early lead. But Ballington soon found the pace too slow. He had his own schedule to keep. He was ahead of the course record schedule, but he had stomach pains which caused a bad patch. He managed to run off the bad patch, finishing in a record 6 hours, 32 minutes. It was his fourth win in six comrades and his third successive win in the up race. That year, the Hardy Ballington Trophy was given for the first novice to finish. This shows the respect that Ballington was held in by the race organizers. They had believed that this would be his final comrades marathon. In 1938, Ballington was 25 years old. Athletics were generally thought of being part of childhood. By continuing to run at such an older age, Ballington was perhaps threatening his professional career as a clerk at Durban City Council. He had invested a lot of time in night school to gain that position. Bill Cochran had retired at 24. Ballington is credited with saying, I've had enough. I have to get on with my work now, and I can't manage work and marathon running. But work was not the only reason for Ballington easing off his massive running load. Hardy married Lorraine Madge Baldwin that December, and World War II started. What Ballington did during the war is not known. In South Africa, thousands of men of military age went to camps prior to being called up. It seemed likely that Ballington did not enter the armed forces, either for medical reasons or because of his important role in local government. 
After the war, the 1946 Comrades had only 22 starters. Many men had not been released yet from the South African forces. Pallington decided to enter the race and had covered 2,000 miles in training over the previous five months. Unfortunately, a week before the race, he was forced off the road by a car and injured his ankle badly. Retiring running competitor Bill Cochran had been captured in the war. He decided in a prisoner of war camp to run again. He won the 1946 Comrades in 7 hours and 2 minutes. The following year, 1947, Ballington, aged 34, was intent on following in the footsteps of his mentor Arthur Newton and win a fifth Comrades. Just 47 runners set off. Ballington took the lead after 90 minutes and went on to win in 6 hours 41 minutes. He then announced his retirement from Comrades. In 1949, his younger brother, John, ran Comrades again and wanted to DNF at 34 miles and again at 45 miles. When you feel like giving up, remember why you started. When you feel like quitting, remember what you're doing it all for. Hardy responded fiercely, No Ballington has retired yet. If you do, you change your name to something else. Finish, and you are still a Ballington. Its effect on his younger brother was dramatic. He finished second in 6 hours, 52 minutes. In 1948, Hardy Ballington finished fourth in the South African Marathon Championships in 2 hours, 44 minutes. This may well have been his last race. As a handler, he maintained his connection with the comrades, most notably with his brother John. He also continued his long-distance friendship with Arthur Newton, who he probably saw as a father figure. This continued until Newton's death in 1959. With South Africa's tourist attractions, Ballington left the Treasury Department and set up his own travel agency to take full advantage of Durban's tourist potential. Operating such a business appealed to Ballington who worked out schedules and timetables for the Union Castle ships and the trains for prospective tourists and travelers. It was said that he had traveled around the world six times during his years as a travel agent. He was also a keen amateur filmmaker and showed color films of the Victoria Falls, Drakensberg Mountains, and the Kruger National Park with close-ups of lions, giraffes, zebras, and elephants in the wild. Hardy Ballington died in his sleep in April 1974 at the age of 61, likely of a genetic heart issue. The collected materials of his running career that were stored in a garage in Westville, Durban, were unfortunately lost over the years. His friend Vernon Jones became the only source of information on his running. Ballington had followed closely Newton's ideas of heavy training miles at slow speed. He did no specific speed training. He was not a fast runner by modern standards with a marathon best of 2 hours 37 minutes, but at longer distances, he was remarkable. He competed infrequently and ran long training runs of 40 to 50 miles on the weekends. Hardy Ballington left a remarkable impact on ultra running in South Africa and was later overshadowed by the great runner Wally Hayward, who also went on to win five comrades. The two greats never raced head to head and the memory of Ballington drifted off as he became the forgotten great ultra runner. With that, this is Davy Crockett, and this is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I hope you run fast and far, enjoy life, get outdoors, and most of all, stay safe and don't take unnecessary chances. <laughs>